Hi, everybody out there in internet land. This is Patrick O'Bannon from the Islesboro Historical Society welcoming you to our third summer program during this uh, season of COVID and virtual summer from the Historical Society. We're happy that you're able to join us. Uh, I don't have too much to say before I introduce our speaker tonight. Um, but I will thank everybody who's been involved in putting on our virtual summer activities at the Historical Society. They have done yeoman's service throughout the season. Um, and if you haven't checked out our webpage and our summer programs and our summer arts and craft show, please do so. The arts and craft show will be up until maybe after Labor Day, but certainly up through the end of August. And um, some of these presentations and other events that we have had this summer will be archived and available online for you so you can stop by and take take a look at those whenever you feel like it um without any further ado our program tonight is uh on titled the unbroken thread textile production in maine from 1820 to 1920 uh and it's going to be presented by nancy alexander who has been a part-time resident of Islesboro for 40 years, and then, according to her bio, had the good sense to become a full-time resident five years ago. She received her PhD in 2005 from the University of Maine in an area of interest being women's work in the 19th century, particularly around Penobscot Bay. Her thesis, thesis and dissertation are in the collection at the Historical Society, along with other papers she has written, She's often spoken on her topics around the state and has taught at the College of the Atlantic and is now happy to do her research and writing and her weaving and spinning right here on Islesboro. So without any further to do, um, oh, I will say that we are going to use the Q&A format. So if you go down to the bottom of your uh, Zoom screen, you will see a little icon that says Q&A. If you have questions during the presentation, you can type them in there. At the end of the presentation, we will have a Q&A session with Nancy. I will read out questions and she will uh, answer them to the best of her ability. Um, so that's, I think, the only sort of bookkeeping thing we need to, we need to take care of right now. So if, you know, check out the Q&A if you have any questions you want to give at the end. And without any further to do, here's Nancy Alexander. Take it away. I'm trying to take it away. There we go. There, there we go. go. So I'm seeing this over here. Is that all right? Yep. OK. Well, good evening, and thanks for joining the IHS speaker series this evening. Um, I would like you, this is a first for me, by the way. <laughs> This is not my usual gig. I would like you to look at this flying shuttle. It races through the warp threads on a loom and in a spring action, automatically races back thousands and thousands of times, creating whatever weave the loom was threaded to make. Please note the sharp metal points on the flying shuttle. Last fall, two friends approached me to join them in creating a project for Maine's Bicentennial Celebration. And we put our heads together, we traveled, we ate meals, we discussed, we researched, and we offered our program. We received lots of invitations to speak, but were unable to do so because of the COVID, COVID curtain dropping. We were able to present this once at the Camden Library, and it was a great um, it was a great pleasure to do that. Nope, I didn't mean to do that. There we go. That'll teach me. Why can't I? There they are. Okay. This is the first spinner's retreat in the 1980s, 
We held it at the Red House on Islesboro. These are my happy sidekicks, um, the earlier, the early spinners and weavers that I spent time with. So here we are celebrating Maine's 200th birthday, and we may take Maine's existence for granted. After all, it's been around for some time, and we see no reason for it not to continue. As we are also celebrating another simple thing, one that we take for granted as well, and that's homemade textiles. And again, we see no reason for them not to continue. But don't panic, I'm not going to ask you to never wear nylon again. I promise. We three are a part of a much larger group of people who revel in natural fibers, fibers that have been alive, coming from animals and insects and plants and have clothed people and kept them warm and decorated their lives for thousands of years. And why, when there are so many new sources of man-made materials that we can wear and use, why do we revel so gladly in these natural fibers? Because these fibers are wild, widely accessible. They require no petroleum products or poisons, and we can make things from these fibers. We can spin them into the finest silk or the heaviest wool. We can weave them into soft, warm blankets or durable coats or fantastical sculptures. Knit them into warm socks or knot them into rugs with our own hands using the same or very similar techniques and skills and tools that have been in use for millennia all over the world. And when their time is done, they can return to the earth. There is little heart in nylon or polyester or microfibers, for they were never alive. So we're going to trace the history of cotton, wool, and silk here in Maine for the past 200 years, showing you the old tools and techniques and how they were adapted to factory manufacture here in Maine, and how the industry changed the face and demographics of Maine, and how the home at-home skills did not get lost with the manufacturing. And now 200 years later, when the mills have almost gone, how the home skills not only still survive here, but thrive here. So for 200 years and into the future, this is the latest spinning retreat. We take over an entire lodge. Um, the, so for 200 years and into Maine's future, the thread from the earliest twisted bit of sheep tuft on a bush right to our spinning wheels here, that thread remains unbroken. So I want to introduce you to the first speaker um, who isn't here. <laughs> so this is my mentor. Um, and uh, in spinning and weaving, she has pretty much put down her shuttles now and taken up her love of spinning wheels, particularly the style called the Great Wheel. There's Suzanne you, spinning her, with her Great Wheel. She lives in Hog Bay in Franklin, and that's her view in the winter. Out, and she looks like she's in a Zen mode. I think that great wheel does that to people. She's learned to recognize different cultural identifiers um, in the who made the wheels and some case, cases can even identify specific makers. At present she's happy to receive old wheels and try to find them new homes and not just great wheels. Those are her collection of great wheels that she would love to find homes for. This is a Saxony wheel, I believe. There are Saxony wheels, flax wheels, production wheels, traditional wheels. I don't know all the names. Personally, I have a modern production wheel um, and also an antique flax wheel and one shaped in a very traditional fashion. Suzanne lives in Hancock County in this town of Franklin and she is grandmothering, as you can see in the corner, she's grandmothering another generation of spinners and weavers. Let me show you my, um, my production, my modern production wheel. It's, it's sitting on my, uh, can you, does that show? No. 
That's right. Right. I have to go. Yeah, I have to stop. You've got to stop screen sharing. Yeah. yeah. It's not letting me. Oh, because I'm not using that. I'm, okay. Yep, you're good. Let's take a look at your wheel. I'm trying to get it. I can't <laughs> see it. My my thing is my my this is blank to me. It's just Oh, uh, okay. Yeah. Cuz we're 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 no longer screen sharing. If you do the the command tab trick that I showed you to jump back to Zoom, you should be able to see yourself. Oh, this takes two hands, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah. Okay, I'm sorry that this is confusing for me, but it is. Oops. We can actually, so Nancy, I could just tell you, you could tilt your screen down a little bit. We can actually see your wheel already. Yeah, you there can? you go. Yeah, okay. totally. There you go. Okay. That's, well, that's beautiful. It's very strange because it's lopsided and it, it is a superb big time production wheel. Yeah. So now let's see if I can get this anywhere near where it was before. Sure. Yep. Okay. So now how do we get back here? Well, we're going to screen share again. Oh, great. Okay. Yeah. Oh, your voice is so calm. It's wonderful. There you go. So here, this is, um, this is, I was the center, the second speaker, the center speaker of this. <clears throat> and I think my friends invited me to do this because I would legitimize their quirks. <laughs> and I hope I have. So let's start with this graph. Oh, where's my graph? There. Let's start with this graph, which I totally made up. It is imaginary, unscientific graph I have drawn badly in order to show you the enduring nature of the, um, of <clears throat> the traditional versus the transitory nature of industrial textile produ production. So this is, has, this is the traditional down here at the bottom, and this is the uh, industrial. The traditional was pre-1820, so I had to start at some place. And here are different events that took place that you can see affected the amount of traditional going on as well as the amount of industrial textile making. Um, at the beginning here, Maine's population was 300,000. A hundred years later, it had grown only to 771,000. And today, the population hasn't even doubled from 1920. So we're a very slow growing state. So while the tradition was passed on for years, and while the percentage of practitioners went down, it was about 25% of the population actually was active in traditional textile making. The percentage went down over the years, but the actual number of makers did not, I believe. So at this point, this was 75,000, which was one quarter of 300,000. And I believe it's probably around 75,000 today. There've got to be. Today, spinners, knitters, and weavers in Maine could easily reach 75,000 in number. In the late 1700s, Great Britain was so powerful it decreed that it was illegal to weave cloth using industrial machines in its 13 American colonies. And their possessive attitude continued even after the United States became a sovereign nation. Leading the Industrial Revolution, remember William Blake and the dark satanic mills, the Brits controlled the very lucrative textile industry by prohibiting anyone knowledgeable about their machinery to leave the country. On pain of imprisonment, Americans sold raw cotton and wool to the Brits to turn into cloth, and then Americans bought back the products of their own raw materials. So we made many of our textiles ourselves by hand here at home. There was a, yeah. oh. how do I get back? Oh. 
here's sheep shearing with um, hand shears. The idea is to take as much off the sheep all in one piece. And although it's not in one piece, you can use it as one piece and fold it. That way, if you're processing the wool, like, um, like wool is processed together. This is carding where you take that fleece that was and brush it to try to make all the hairs go in the same direction, but also get air into it so that you can spin it. And here is Molly spinning wool, but she didn't card this. She took this right from the sheep. It's called spinning in the grease. Often the entire family uh, participated in creating this homemade thread. There were some small seasonal carding and spinning mills for the neighborhood and traveling spinsters and weavers, but basically every household had a spinning wheel or two and a loom in the attic or the barn. Fortunately, Yankee ingenuity, in this case we call it smuggling, found a way to get around the British ban. Here we have um, a Brit, Samuel Slater, in 1789 declared himself a mechanic and memorized the process of the spinning mills and headed for America, headed up, ending up in Rhode Island and building a small spinnery and sharing his knowledge. The Brits called him Slater the Traitor. Little spinnery sprang up throughout New England, including the District of Maine. Francis Lowell in 1810, uh, visited Britain from Boston. He memorized the entire weaving process and machinery and came home to make sketches and write it down. He even smuggled pieces of equipment into Boston in boxes labeled Bibles. By 1813, he and fellow investors had built a cotton mill in Waltham, Massachusetts, and others quickly followed. The area's population skyrocketed in only 10 years from 2,500 in 1826 to 18,000 in 1836. The jig was up for the British monopoly. These Boston tycoons also realized that they were creating something that would forever change American society as they knew it, but they didn't know how. More about that later. Of course, in 1820, the brand new state of Maine had no such industry. Buying and selling things in Maine was conducted largely on the barter system except in the larger port towns where cash money was used. Farmers raised sheep for the wool or flax for linen. A woman could swap 10 pairs of mittens for two pairs of children's shoes and have a sufficient credit at the local store from her fresh eggs to purchase the English fabrics to sew a dress for herself and her daughter. Rural people worked to be self-sufficient in their food, clothing, and shelter. Creating their own textiles helped them reach this goal. Maine's potential water power had not gone unnoticed. Massachusetts investors inspired by Lowell arrived in, in Saco in 1826, building the York Mills, the first large industrial mill of any kind in Maine. It burned down two years later, but was rebuilt and up and running again in 1832. Eventually, there would be eight huge mills on Saco Island, employing over 9,000 people. It was one of the largest cotton complexes in the country. The town population was around 2,000 in 1830. And in 25 years, it had increased 350% to almost 9,500. The other monster complex in the state was Bates Manufacturing Company in Lewiston, founded in 1850. That mill carded and spun cotton and then wove it into sheeting and later printed it at one time employed, employing 5,000 people and several mills under the Bates name. In both Lewiston and Saco, the powerful rivers that provided the energy to turn the machinery required a constant flow of water, so the developers constructed canals to regulate its speed and volume. There, that changed the nature of the rivers with whatever, along with whatever polluted the rivers below the mills. The massive influx of population into the larger mill towns caused huge social changes as well. And this is where I want to talk about the social effects of the arrival of the Industrial Revolution in the form of these mills. 
To their credit, right from the start, the Massachusetts investors realized that they were creating a new society of sorts, and they had to take good care of their Massachusetts workers. Workers were mostly country girls who wanted to get off the farm and out of their mother's kitchens. Men were having adventures going west and to sea, and the girls wanted adventure as well. Companies in the Waltham area built dormitories for the girls with house mothers to see that they obeyed the rules and behaved themselves. There were curfews, dormitory newspapers, singing groups, theater groups. They were fed and housed and they could do their laundry, have gentlemen callers, and attend church services. However, they were not encouraged to learn how to repair the machinery, the machines, make the machines, or control the machines. Essentially, they were part of the machines. Employment was about 50-50 between men and women, and men were the supervisors as well. You see all those belts running down from the ceiling axles to the machines? The men ran those machines, as you can see. Catching your sleeve or skirt in one of those belts could mean your death if you were a woman. For the new large main mills, the owners did as they had in Massachusetts, building the dormitories and creating a safe destination for girls and women. However, the women did not forget their home manufacturing skills, evidenced by the fact that most of the initial wave of country girls eventually returned home and continued the traditional ways of creating their own products from local wool and flax. Those returned home continued to spin a homely common thread. They perceived their jobs as seasonal and they had a home to go to if they wanted to. They were not accustomed to the regimentation that was required in the mills. Fortunately for the mill owners and the new Irish immigrants in the 1830s and on, there were plenty of job openings for both men and women. Also, immigrants came as families and not just single women and they did not have homes to run home to if they didn't like their job. A stable labor force was created and then replicated itself in the children. Some cotton came from the South. Oh, come on, I'll try that, see if that does it. Yes, some cotton came from the South um, by rail, but much of it came by ships and they had to build ships um, that were so watertight that the cotton didn't get wet. And they used that same, they had that same problem when Mainers were shipping lime out of state later on in the century. They couldn't have water touch the lime because it would start fires. So the shipping, the, the so special ships carry the cotton bales. And they came to small main mills to, to be spun. These small mills often became the biggest attraction for helping a town to grow. In 1810, the first small wool cotton mill was built in Wilton by a local man. The town's population tripled in size by 1840. Bartlett yarn in Harmony, Maine was built in 1821 and as a carding mill was, and as a carding mill, but expanded to include spinning wool. Harmony's population grew by 85% before the Civil War. Today, the population is less than it was in, 19, in 1840. The mill is still small and active using spinning mules that they purchased in 1947, the last such technology in the entire country. All these mills were small scale. Today, you can go to Harmony, Maine and purchase spun and dyed yarns made from Maine wool. Local women beyond the mills could also earn money through the traditional methods of outwork or piecework, receiving prepared warps of yarn to be woven to an agent's specification and then returning the finished product to them. Women were paid on the basis of units made, like a dozen mittens or 100 yards of cloth or 25 dip nets, which is an excellent way for islanders here to make some extra money. In the 1830s, Maine started a silk industry, which lasted until 1930. You could, come on, there we go. You could raise the worms in your own home and plant mulberry bushes in your back field to feed the worms. When textile mills 
enticed women and girls away to, to the towns, they're leaving the farm left a financial ga gap in the household income. So raising silkworms offered an alternative source of money. However, there were never enough wool socks and mittens on a farm or wool socks and mittens in the forest or aboard a fishing boat. Creating a homespun common thread continued. Before, hmm, yeah. So where am I? Oh, command tab, right? You're on our screen, we can see you. Oh, yep. um, okay. Um, before 1800, 1860, many people from Ireland had arrived to work in the mill. mills, but after that time, Canadians, mostly of French descent, migrated, immigrated to Maine and owners were very happy to have an additional labor pool. In 1861, French Canadians outnumbered native born workers and Irish immigrants, and soon the language of the big mill towns became French. By 1908, Biddeford's population of 11,000 uh, was 11,000, of which 8,000 were French Canadian. In 30 years, the town's population had almost tripled. Bates Manufacturing in Lewiston grew to have eight mills as well, and Lewiston is still the largest French-speaking community in the entire country. The work stayed the same, but with a new influx of workers, and the growing mill sizes, living situations in the mills themselves began to deteriorate. This is what the mills owners had feared and done their best to prevent. Owners could no longer offer the housing and social control that they had originally practiced. And... Hey, Nancy. Yes. Um, we need you to share your screen again. There you go. Perfect. Okay. Now we got it. Yep. Okay. I'm just, here we go. That's the Bates Mill. Yep. Notice the, um, the lint on the floor there. Then uh, that little girl is part of the machinery. And those boys in bare feet. Yay, yay, yay. <laughs> Families had to scramble to find housing and earn sufficient salaries to support themselves. Child labor was used to wind bobbins and other repetitive jobs. Remember the flying shuttle with its metal points? Children could get caught by a flying, sh flying shuttle running off its track, and the steel ends could do some serious damage to a small-boned individual. Child labor was addressed illegally as early as 1847 in relation to working conditions and school attendance, but children's earnings helped families to survive state government moved to protect the children again in 1908. Many of the local mills opened and closed within a decade around the Civil War and had only a few employees, while larger mills employed hundreds of people and some employed thousands. The Civil War required a great deal of wool, blue wool fabric for the uniforms of the North. This is our cleaning crew, we saw them before. After the war, housing continued to be a problem. Children had to, ch schools had to expand, transportation was needed, town infrastructure began to lag behind the needs. New churches were built to cater to the workers. Discrimination against the latest immigrants' arrival called misery. Politics changed from the expected to the unexpected. And the early honest resolve of mill owners to take care of their employees had failed. Considering the number of people, there was no way they could have succeeded. On the other hand, even so, kids do have a talent for having fun, and those canals to regulate water were put to good use. Meanwhile, the women of Maine spun their wool, knit socks and mittens and scarves and wool blankets for the family. I'm just trying to make this, you know, relevant to today. Silk production continued. James Haskell built a mill on the Presumpscot River in Westbrook for manufacturing woolen goods, but later turned it into silk spinning. 
By 1882, Haskell began the weaving of silk and then dyeing it. Those are the cocoons and, and the women had to find the thread and then get a whole bunch of them unraveling together. And they all had to be kept in this bath that is warm because silk is sticky in the cocoon. Haskell's silk was a huge success, employing almost 300 workers at its height. Haskell Silk Company was considered one of the most respectable, stable, and enduring silk companies to be found nationwide. In 1930, rayon came in to replace silk threads and the silk industry in Maine and around the country collapsed. The Haskell Mill shut its doors. Another invention that changed textile history was a sewing machine invented by Mr. Isaac Singer and available to the public in 1851. Clothing manufacturers manu grew in many main towns, making particularly men's clothes like vests, pants, and coats. Outwork changed from weaving and knitting to sewing clothing. In Clinton in 1889, Rich's factory assembled 75,000 pairs of men's pants created by 140 family members. However, 100 families sewed for riches at their homes, and the other 40 workers were actually in this factory. A bath company made 1,800 coasts and vests a week. Outwork of one sort or another continued into the 20th century. Main woolen mills were busy. You know the saying, clothes make the man? Well, ready-made clothes within financial reach of many men from different segments of society one could no longer judge a man in his place in the social system by his clothes. A judge and a boat builder and a farmer could all own the same clothes. These industrial revolution changes helped create a real middle class. Meanwhile, women in the more rural areas took advantage of sewing machines, but did not give up their spinning wheels and looms and knitting needles. They worked with a common thread of the women stored their will, their wheels and looms in the barn and were glad to see them go. Mill working conditions continued to deteriorate along with the maintenance of the buildings and the housings. This is a wool carding mill. You remember the woman using hand carters to make the fibers straight? Well, this did huge amounts. Um, the air was filled with fiber bits smaller than lint that irritated the lungs. Rattling machinery was very loud, shaking the buildings all day. Oh, come on. There. Temperatures in the mills had to be warm and the humidity had to be high in order to have the best control over the fibers as they were spun and woven. While there were lots of windows in the factories, they were for light and not to be opened so the air was dirty, stale, and unhealthy. Light was a problem in the large floors as the centers of the rooms remained shaded. The first electrification of the mills was for center lighting. There were efforts to unionize and go on strike and seek better conditions in pay, but rarely were the workers successful. The second half of the 19th century were the golden years of mills in Maine and their towns had healthy economies, but many of the mills were old and safe, some unsafe. Some owners began building new buildings or fixing up the old ones as best they could, and others were closing their doors. Moving south, they could build new up-to-date building, buildings and pay less in labor and shipping expenses. However, Bartlett Mills in Harmony was still humming. York Manufacturing had grown and continued production on Saco Island. The Bates Mill in Lewiston continued to grow. In Springfield, Springvale, around 1880, the Jager family started a Worcester woolen mill and it continues today under the name Jager Swan. On the whole, however, only the bigger operations continued but on 1930. Jager Spun and, and Springvale and Bartlett and Harmony are the only ones I know of that still survive. Although I read in the paper the other day that a Guilford mill is now, who, um, in, that employed 300 people making fabric for furniture companies, for office furniture companies, saw the end of their orders 
um, in February, people, they realized that people were going to close their offices. So they were having no orders and they switched their production from that kind of textile to textiles for healthcare workers that has specific requirements. And so they were small, they were agile, and they were smart. Many main industrial mills had come, had come oh, here we go. Um, um, towns and families reeled from the loss of jobs and paychecks in the, 18, in the end of the 1800s. Many main industrial textile mills had come, worked, and left. But the draw of the natural fibers never left. Many big mills shut their doors, selling their equipment out of state and out of the country. Women who knew the traditional skills made sure they introduced others to these arts, despite the advent of man-made thread that couldn't be made at home. Ah, that natural common thread. Meanwhile, the arts and crafts movement developed in Britain and spread to America in the 1880s and early 1900s. It was based on a rejection of the new industrial era of production and followed a philosophy of working excellence with a craftsman-like craftsman ethic. Women who made textiles and loved their wheels and looms agreed and got back to work. When the First World War began, the women were ready and out came those wheels from the attics and barns and knitting needles to do the jobs that needed to be done for men in wartime, warm socks and mittens, scarves and blankets. Local textile making had not completely stopped. A few of the older, bigger mills struggled on or combined under joint ownership. Between the wars, cultivation of the home-based arts began a resurgence. Canning food, gardening, and the traditional textile arts became something between hobbies and a statement of lifestyle. When Scott Nearing published his book, The Good Life, he had tapped into an already present desire of people to simplify and escape some of the demands of this new industrial world that took so much away and gave so little satisfaction back. This desire earned itself the name Back to the Land Movement. There began a small quiet migration here in late 1940s and early 50s with a new population of urban escapees. Meanwhile, spinners and weavers stayed on a low simmer, deepening their spills and skills and appreciation of their crafts, gathering energy. They were fueled by the likes of Scott and Helen Nearing and others who talked of self-sufficiency and the power of the land. Then, when the Back to the Land movement became a stampede of sorts in the 1960s and 70s, the stage was already set, the ingredients laid out, and many Mainers were willing to mentor, to be good neighbors, to share their skills, so these new residents could thrive in their new homes. Maine's population had been growing very slowly for years, but it increased by over 13% in the 70s. Meanwhile, the women had continued to treadle away, make their needles click, and beat the wefts into place. They have never stopped spinning the common thread. In the early 1970s, a guy named George Christopher from Bodenham had a new flock of sheep and was learning about sheep dogs and coyotes. His fleece went to the Bartlett Yarns Mill in Harmony, and his his yarn became the rage for knitters here in Maine and others who were exposed to it. Another young man, Peter Hegarty, had traveled to the USSR in 1990 and met with some sheep raisers. He came home with the idea of peace fleece, having Maine fleece carded together with Russian fleece, spun and sold in both countries. He is still at it, including other countries as well. Our Congresswoman for the First District, Shelley Pingree, was part of the new movement. This is her logo. Owning sheep on North Haven Island and making up knitting kits and pattern books for sweaters and mittens. Craft galleries began to dot the landscape and sell artisan work. The Maine Weavers Guild developed an active statewide series of educational gatherings. Same with spinners, creating their own groups in their own areas. In Bar Harbor, College of the Atlantic had classes in spinning and plant dyeing. The Farnsworth Museum in Rockland held exhibits of rugs woven in Maine. People began using indigo and growing matter for their natural dyes. They wanted to color that common thread. In Hollowell, Brahms and Mount, a couple with backgrounds in, in fabric design and weaving machinery, found an old space, bought old industrial looms, and built their business using main place names for their products that today enjoys a niche market all over the country. 
Swan's Island Blankets, just down the road from us here, began with sheep raised on a Penobscot Bay Island, but has moved to the mainland and uses many sources for their lovely hand loom products. Rag rug weaver uh, Sarah Hodgkiss creates brilliant rag rugs, taking a simple but useful way of recycling old fabric to a new level of skill and design. Suzanne Grossjean, my mentor, is noted throughout the region for her gorgeous wool rugs. The hand spun and local machine spun industry, yarn industry is constantly growing, with numbers of knitters increasing as well. Spinning groups meet weekly all over the state. They celebrate the common thread. And in Bath, a yarn company called Halcyon opened in the 1970s and it has patrons from all over the country. It's hard to drive over that bridge in Bath without stopping. The town of Saco, with its great hulking abandoned brick mills, didn't know how to deal with them. Here is their solution and the answer is terrific. Similar uses are happening in many old mills. The Bates Mill was the last to close. We enjoyed a delicious lunch in one of the new businesses located in the old mill. So it's interesting when you think of the natural resources in Maine, we have textiles and now they're making healthcare clothing. We had a lumber industry or, or wood products industry, nasal, nasal swabs, and we had paper companies, toilet paper. Interesting evolution for the state of Maine and its industries. A totally different kind of textile effort is taking place in Southern Maine under the aegis of Dory Waxman, a woman of many parts. Dory owned a wool-based clothing business called Old Port Wool and Textile until the mills closed and she could no longer get Maine fabric. So she moved her skills to the classroom and is teaching some of the Portland's areas, new immigrants, how to sew clothing. Since the departure of the mills and outwork replaced by huge factories in the south of us, commercial clothing production in Maine had almost stopped. Dory's bringing back a skill set that makes it possible for clothing designers to come back to Maine and find trained workers, while the workers have an entree into the economy of Maine, a whole new way to grow a state. She finds jobs for her graduates, and the businesses have to meet her standards of fair labor, working conditions, time off, and pay scales. This is a win-win-win situation for the workers, the businesses, and the state of Maine. Starcroft, a small carding mill down east, has a special story. Back in the early 1900s, a lighthouse keeper's daughter raised some sheep on Nash Island down east where her family was stationed. Her name was Jenny Cerrone, and she has become sort of a legend. Apologies to Peter Ralston for this picture. The family lived there for many years with a complete farm satisfying most of their needs. After her family left the island, Jenny continued to raise sheep there and on another island nearby. The fleece of these sheep is special, very special. It's silky and shiny with a long staple. Some people say that the sheep eat enough seaweed to make their wool that way. You see, there are no predators on an island. And so it's a very, that's why there's a hog island and a cow island and a ram island and a sheep island. They were, they, you could just let them do their thing and they did very well. The breeding of the sheep has been carefully managed as well. Jenny died in 2004 at the age, age of 92. A neighborhood group has protected the islands and their flocks. Starcroft Cat, uh, Carding Mill has exclusive access to the Nash Island fleece and they have always made sure to hold out the absolute best fleeces for hand spinners. Starcroft cleans and cards the rest, sending it to spinneries and markets if you're in Maine and elsewhere. New spinneries are popping up all over the state like a rustic fiber works in Ashland and Maine Top and New Inn in Waldeboro. The industry is growing on a very human scale. It is a great pleasure to be part of this unbroken thread. Our third presenter was Susan Merrill, a teacher, spinner, and weaver, and contemporary fiber artist, thinking about and using traditional materials in a new way. She is in demand as a special 
artist in residence at schools or in communities where she has built, people build a very large tapestry loan um, outdoors. She calls them earth looms and people can weave into the warps things found in nature or anything like twigs, bark, grasses, feathers, milkweed, stones, hair, etc. She also makes a fanciful masks out of wool decorated in natural materials. Her concerns are spiritual for our relationship to the natural word, world and how we imagine we fit in it. She is truly remarkable. I would like to close with assuring you that I do own microfiber clothing and it works well for me. I also wish to assure you that traditional textile production is really fun. Almost 20 years ago, a member of our spinning group had cancer and she couldn't pay her bills. Someone came up with the great idea of putting out a calendar like the one the English ladies published where every month featured a very prim and proper, not totally revealing nude photograph, women in hats and pearls with a cup of tea. We made many thousands of dollars as nude spinners. <laughs> We paid off Gail's bills, and then some of the people went to Ulaanbaatar to visit sheep herds. May I um, show you part of our clever little calendar? This is a Nash Island fleece. It came out all in one piece, and she, this spinner, is skirting it, taking off the bad edges that she doesn't want to work with. So. This is a very short history of a very long story, the role of textiles, both industrial and traditional fibers, the unbroken thread. Here in the grand state of Maine, it had quite a ride. Thanks for watching. Um, any questions? Take it away, Patrick. Hi. Thank you, Nancy. That was pretty wonderful. Um, remember to put your questions into the Q&A uh, heading there at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Nancy, I just wanted to ask a question about the industrial mills in Maine. And I assume that the ones in Saco and, and uh, Lewiston are bankrolled from out of state. Can do you know anything about about how much of it is local investment as opposed to investment from Massachusetts? For those two big complexes, it was all out of state. Yeah. Mostly Massachusetts for the York thing. Francis Lowell had a whole cadre of friends who wanted to be part of this. Right. And um, so you look at Lowell, Lawrence that whole area, those names are family names, but there was one fellow named Appleton who did not come into that. Uh, he didn't get a hot, he didn't get a town. <laughs> but we have an Appleton Ridge and I don't know if there's a correlation there or not. We can probably figure that out. Right. Um, Doug Weldon is wondering about the connection between Francis Lowell and Lowell, Massachusetts. There it is. It was named in honor of him. He died um, much too young um, and the mills, I don't think he ever saw full fruition of those mills. I think it was, um, I think if he was like 1817 that he died. It was just, it was a terrible, it couldn't have been that, but it was, it was close to that. It's a little later than that, but yeah, yeah. it's, it's but, early on before wool really becomes fully fleshed out. Huge, right. 1830. And, and in, staying, in staying with the theme, um, Doug's wondering about the connection between the Bates Mill and Bates College. Yes, um, I believe that the Bates Mill and the Bates College are closely connected or were at one time starting um, trying to provide, again, something to give back to the community. I mean, these, these mill owners wanted their money, but if they had a lot of it, they knew they needed to give it back and or give something back, and they did. And I think that was part of it. Yeah. Yeah. Let's see. Carol Pearson 
is asking, you mentioned flax, but didn't talk much about how flax plant was raised and turned into fiber and linen. Can you please expand on this? I'm so glad you asked that, Carol. <laughs> <laughs> flax was um, forced on Mainers to grow. Everybody had to grow flax at one point. And it was, it's a real pain in the neck. It is my favorite yarn um, thread. It's, it, but it is brutal to graze and process. And there was no processing mill for it. And what you do is you can, it, flax is, is a pretty, it looks like a pretty gla grass. And it has very fibrous stems and has blue flowers. And then you harvest them and you dry the stems. But first, you ret them. R-E-T. It's one of those coarse puzzle words. Um, and people had retting ponds. And they soaked the, the stems in there, waiting for the vegetation to rot away. And then they had, then they had this, these, these uh, veins, like the celery strings. You know, there were these strings inside there. And they had to be um, broken up, and they had to be um, well hetcheled, and they had to be braked. And all, you know, there were there were linen breaks where you had to soften it up by breaking it um, in a very methodical way. And so nobody they tried to grow flax here, but there was no processing. It all had to be done at home. However, in the um, late 90s or early 2000s, there was a movement um, in um, Arusha County to grow flax, where they were trying to find alternative um, products for the farmers to grow. And they grew the flax and they um, harvested the flax, and then they discovered there was no way to process it because there was no processing mill north of North Carolina. <laughs> and yes. um, and then mysteriously the building that it was in burned <laughs> it's amazing and that was an out-of-state investment as well is is hemp processed in a similar way to yes. to flax yes and so that hemp the actually the mill in north carolina now is really a hemp a hemp processing mill yeah and it's not for the C, B, D, P, X, Y, Z. It's for um, the fabric. Yeah. That's fascinating. I mean, the linen, the processing, I always wondered about processing linen because I knew that it was a plant, not an animal fiber. And I always thought this has got to be really complicated. And it is. It is. Um, bamboo is the same way. There's something called Ramy that grows, that were probably the bulrushes in Egypt where Moses was found, was in Ramy. <laughs> Those are all very complicated um, and very hard work to process. So Marilyn Smith is wondering whether spinning is a seasonal activity. No, it is an everyday activity. And the beauty of it is that it's sort of zen. You get into this rhythm and you can do it by touch. You don't have to see very well. And that means that you can do it at night by firelight. But everybody had to spin because it takes what is it there's some ratio of how much if you have an hour if a weaver has an hour how many hours the spinner has to weave for has to spin for them and it depends of course on the fineness of the yarn but it is extraordinarily time consuming 10 year olds 10 year olds would be spinning eight year olds would be doing carding mm. yeah. Carol Stahl is wondering if you have a sample of your work that you could show us and also is wondering whether Marcy was part of your spinning group and she assumes that she was. Marcy is not part of my spinning group. My spinning group is in Hancock in Washington County and every once in a while I bop in, <laughs> check in now these days and they check in here. Um, and the, I don't have anything, I don't think I have anything right here that I've made. I work in rag rugs and fine linens and um and then regular table things table linens and scarves and things like that 
But Carol, you can see examples of her work on the uh, arts and crafts page on the Islesboro Historical Society webpage. Good another job. little another little plug. Um, <laughs> And Doug again is asking, when wool was key to clothing in the 1800s, was there a way to make it less itchy and scratchy? Old photos look like the wool wearers were uncomfortable. <laughs> I believe they were uncomfortable. <laughs> but you could, if you could spin a fine enough thread, um, it wouldn't be so heavy. And if you've got good quality wool, it wouldn't be so itchy. One of the problems is, <laughs> that a sheep rolls in hay and it gets burrs in it and it does this and that. And if you buy um, local wools, you will often find little pieces of grass or a seed or something in them. And if you can't, if it is not properly carded or it's not a good quality wool, no, there are wools that are better for wearing and there are wools that are better for rugs. So, I mean, and there's something in between there. And that's, that's why they look itchy. It's not probably great wool. <laughs> Anybody else with questions? This has been really great. No, those are six that are answered. Um, this has been fascinating. Any other questions? You and I should get together. I've been dealing with Lowell, Massachusetts recently. Oh boy. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I have to say that it was so interesting to see how they, the first owners, both in Massachusetts and then Maine, tried so hard to make the mill, <clears throat> the mill work a comfortable thing to do. But when it became families, and in the great numbers that the mill, work, mill owners wanted, it just, there was nothing they could do to, they could do small things to try to salvage it, salvage the living conditions. And, um, and they could have probably given up some of their profit um, for wages, but um, that it, they didn't. And, um, and it did create, but those workers ended up being a very strong middle class. And, and that kind of work really made a difference in this state, I believe. And if they, and if those French Canadians hadn't come, we'd still be 300,000 people. <laughs> Kathy and Mike Kerr have what looks like maybe our last question, which is why is flax a favorite for you for weaving? Oh, all these, uh, these fibers that are alive um, have their own characteristics. And the thing I love is, um, the characteristic of linen is it knows where it's going. It has its own mind and it can really make your life miserable. It wants to be straight. It wants to go in a straight line. And um, I have enjoyed uh, helping it go in straight lines enormously over the years. And I have just funny collections of linen here. Um, I have a studio if anybody would like to stop by. Um, and I'd love to show you some of the things that I've talked about today. Um, I have a spindle, the kind that was in that fly shuttle, um, and some of the other equipment is fascinating. So, you know, I've got the purple doors and I have a new building with purple chairs. <laughs> Stop by. <laughs> Mike, did, did I see that you had a question you wanted to ask? Oh yeah. Um, so interesting little uh, sort of tidbit, I suppose, or a question and, and then, uh, I don't know how to say this exactly, but so uh, Francis Lowell's middle name is what? Cabot. That's right. Yeah. Okay. So and the Cabot's, Cabot speak only to Lowell's. <laughs> okay. And the Lowell's speak only to God. So bringing, well, exactly, and uh, there's another name that is uh, in intimately uh, connected to that, those names, and I'm thinking about Islesboro Connections now, um, and the name is Gardner. And, um, well, and Lawrence. And, and Lawrence, exactly. So do we know if Francis Lowell, perhaps, had any direct connection to the island or the summer community at any point in time? No, because he was here, 
he was born too soon. Too soon. Okay. That's what I figured. But it wasn't a summer community here. I is I find these connections Let's incredibly try. incredibly <laughs> fascinating, you know. Absolutely. And um uh, and it's just so interesting to me how these names continue. You know, and North Haven, North Haven has a whole section called Cabotville. And oh, yeah. Cab yeah, I babysat for them, which was very much fun. Um, and they, they have this huge piece of land around um, Pulpit Harbor, and they've built houses over the years, and they've had, they've had 40 head of sheep, and... Um, they uh and the family is the boston family absolutely right. yeah and is it was it butter island i think is it is it? butter island was i don't know who actually bought that but it was uh purchased to be developed into a summer colony okay i thought that was connected to the cab family as well but maybe uh, not it, it may have been there is another island that they they do own yeah yeah yeah. Anyway, and fascinating they, stuff. But. They've been wonderful stewards of their islands. Oh, I yeah, I'm they, sure. Yeah. They have really. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, all right, that's all kind of <laughs> tangential, but. No, it's fun. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> all right, well, thanks, everybody, for attending. Um, we really appreciate you dropping in virtually to our summer programs. Thank you very much to Nancy for a fascinating presentation. Um, you know, we, we should all go by and check out um, giant collections of spinning wheels, you know. Um, but this has been really fun. Thank you all very much. And we will see you the next time. Hopefully in person, in the building. Who knows? Thanks, everyone. Good night. Thank you. Thanks, Nancy. <laughs>